Hello and welcome back to this hour of news. I'm Belle Lupton. It's 2.30 here in the French capital. Let's remind you of our top stories here on France 24. Northern France braces for more violence ahead of England's Euro 2016 match against Wales. Last night in Lille saw more clashes between England supporters and French riot police. Wreckage found from missing Egypt Air Flight 804, one month after it crashed into the Mediterranean. The race is now on to find the crucial black box before it em stops emitting signals. And two new polls put the Brexit camp well ahead of those voting to stay in the EU. Just a week to go now until Britons vote in a referendum on their membership. Thanks for being with us. And we begin with that EU referendum. Two new polls in the UK show a last minute swing towards Brexit with just a week to go before Britain's vote in that referendum on their EU membership. These are just the latest in a series of polls showing a shift in public opinion away from the EU and towards an out vote. The president of the European Commission has responded saying the EU is not in danger of death if Britain leaves. Shirley Sitbon, Shirley Sitbon reports. The Leave campaign is picking up speed. Previous polls have already given the lead to the out camp. But Thursday's Ipsos survey shows it has a six percentage point margin, with 53 percent against 47 percent for the end camp. And here's the other curve the Remain campaigners didn't want to see, the odds graphic. It shows what kind of chances betting markets are giving both sides. The figures they're forecasting for the Remain camp have never been lower, about 60 percent. Voters' top issues have also changed. Concerns over immigration come first. Well, how it's changed is um, influx of Europeans from Eastern Europe. We've just got too, it's big, the percentage of them in the town is just becoming too much, you know, and it's dragged the town down because there's been white flight as well, which is, is what's happening, and people are just moving away. Yeah. The outcamp has convinced some voters that leaving the EU would allow the UK to control migrant flows. It has also passed a message saying the EU costs too much money. Yeah, if we come out of the EU, we can support our own country, which we should do, and instead of helping everyone else out, billions and all that, but where, where the money's going nowhere, isn't it? Polls also show voters have little confidence in politicians. 46% believe both camps have been spreading lies, according to Ipsos. One-fifth say they could still change their mind. Well, for more on that EU referendum next week, let's take you live now to Scotland, where our correspondent Hervé Amoric is taking the temperature of British voters, or has been. He's now in Glasgow, in the, in the region around Glasgow. And Hervé, this news of a swing in public opinion towards leaving the EU can't be going down very well in Scotland, can it? Well, in Scotland, uh, we've been following the campaign here. We're near Glasgow in the Scottish countryside. And people are not as engaged here as they are in England for two reasons. There's a bit of referendum fatigue. People have been called to vote for four times in the last uh, less than two years here. And then uh, to people here, the EU is not a major problem as it is for some in England. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, you would find that... Uh, uh, two out of three uh, Scottish people uh, uh, tend to be wanting to, to remain. Uh, in fact, um, you know, people are used to sharing sovereignty in Scotland, different layers of government, local, uh, national government at Westminster and the EU level. And in fact, uh, particularly here near Glasgow, if people could get rid of one layer of government, they'd rather get rid of Westminster than the, that rather than uh, get rid of uh, the EU. They would rather remain in the EU, the majority of them. Uh, but the polls at this stage go one way or the other. I don't think people pay much attention to the polls anymore. Well, that's what I was going to ask you is, is, you know, we've seen a whole bunch of new polls coming in, moving the, the public opinion. How much can we really trust those polls? They got it so wrong uh, in the last British general elections. 
I think people are dazed and confused at this moment in time, whether it's different opinion polls going one way and the other, or economic figures quoted by one side or the other. Recently, uh, the... Uh, uh, the Vote Leave campaign led by uh, Michael Gove, Justice Minister, and the former Mayor of London, Boris, Lo uh, Boris Johnson, uh, have accused uh, the government led by David Cameron and the Remain side of uh, scaremongering or trying to put, put the fear in people's, uh, in people's uh, hearts, uh, particularly uh, when the Chancellor of the Exchequer was promising a new budget of austerity in case of a Brexit saying uh, that, uh, you know, the figures would change so much, the economic prospect would change so much, and he was backed by that by the Bank of England, uh, that uh, this would lead to austerity. On the other hand, you have David Cameron, who is doing exactly the same thing, accusing the Remain side, or accusing Vote Leave, to come up with uh, uh, just imaginary false figures. They're saying, for example, that they will fund all these EU projects that are funded uh, by the EU at the moment with British money, but where are they going to take these monies from? So a big uh, economic war of, of, of figures, you know, one side accusing the other, and the people are just, at this moment in time, confused. Hervé Amorique, thank you very much for that update from Glasgow, and we'll be coming back to you over the next week for plenty more on that EU referendum, which takes place next Thursday. Now, across the Channel, northern France is bracing for more football violence. England and Wales will be meeting on the pitch in half an hour uh, in the town of Lens, just 30 kilometres from Lille, where Russia lost to Slovakia yesterday. French security forces are worried about a repeat of Saturday's violence between England and Russia fans, who are both in the area for their respective matches. Russia risking being thrown out of the Euro 2016 championships if their fans cause any more violence. But let's have a listen to some of the fans congregating in last now. All the English and the Welsh fans have been sat next to each other, no problems at all. I think it's a bit, there's good blood between the two teams. No trouble, no trouble with the Welsh. No. Not with the Welsh and English, maybe the no. Russians. Even the Scottish are here and they're not going to cause trouble either. Some of the fans ahead of that game there. And earlier I spoke to our sports correspondent, Kitty Van Gorgistani, who was in the midst of those fans, but in front of the stadium this time in Lens. I asked her which country's fans were particularly high risk. Well, there are a few uh, countries and a few games that were noted as a high risk, including England uh, versus Wales, as well as the England-Russia game. But uh, the groups that we uh, need to take a closer look uh, at are very different uh, amongst themselves. If you think about uh, the Saturday violence in Marseille, those were some hardcore Russian hooligans uh, that we saw. Uh, the French authorities talked about about 150 highly trained men that came just to fight. They didn't come here for the game. They came to fight and they were ready and they were not drinking at all. They were here uh, to uh, fight, to fight England fans. The difference with England and what we saw yesterday was more of, uh, of supporters very, uh, very drunk because a lot of alcohol was flowing and it kind of got out of hand because of nightfall, because of group uh, and because of uh, the alcohol and most of the violence was more of clashes between between security forces trying to get things under control and the England uh, fans. So very different situations depending on which groups uh, we're looking at. And uh, as I was saying, the worry is that some of these hardcore Russian hooligans might uh, be coming uh, here to take on uh, the England fans who are more of, uh, of uh, very uh, drunk fans that want to get into a fight as opposed to uh, the very hardcore England hooligans who stayed in England because of the cooperation between the French and English authorities ahead of the Euro, with a lot of people that no, were known to be high-risk hooligans, uh, given, uh, asked to give uh, their uh, papers, their passport or their national identity cards in order to prevent them from making it to France. <laughs> Our fearless sports correspondent Kitty Van Gorgistani uh, outside the stadium in Lens where that England-Wales match is kicking off in 20 minutes. Uh, and as well as that England-Wales match, there'll also be uh, today Ukraine versus Northern Ireland meeting in the Stade de Lyon uh, and Germany meeting Poland, this time in the Stade de France just north of Paris.
Wreckage has been found of the Egypt air flight that crashed into the Mediterranean last month. Egyptian investigators say they've located several main areas of the wreckage underwater and they've been able to take images using a deep sea search vessel. It's now a race against time to find the crucial black boxes which should be able to tell investigators just what happened in those final moments before the plane crashed. Uh, now those black boxes will stop emitting signals in the next week or so as Andrew Hillier reports. Somewhere under the eastern Mediterranean Sea may lie the answer to an aviation mystery. After weeks of searching, investigators say they finally located the wreckage of Egypt Air Flight 804. And with it, they could be closer to finding the plane's elusive black boxes. Egypt's government says a deep-sea search vessel has also sent back the first images of the underwater debris. The discovery may be crucial. Both the flight data and cockpit voice recorders could be lying somewhere amongst the wreckage. That data could help determine why the plane went down. Now it's a race against time to track them down. The two black boxes send out signals to help search teams pinpoint their location. Roughly two weeks ago, a French search vessel picked up signals from one of them. But the batteries on those beacons are set to run out next week. All 66 people died when the flight that was heading to Cairo from Paris disappeared from radar screens a month ago over the eastern Mediterranean. Data shows that the plane sent out two smoke alerts from near the cockpit just before it vanished. But those clues alone aren't enough to piece together the reasons behind the crash. For now, its exact cause remains unknown. That report from Andrew Hillier. Now, four days after the mass shooting in a gay nightclub in Orlando, Florida, the US president is heading to the city to meet with the families of the 49 victims. Barack Obama will give a speech to show his solidarity with the LGBT community in Orlando and also throughout the country. More details are continuing to emerge about what happened in the early hours of Sunday morning. But the FBI has yet to determine the motive of gunman, gunman Omar Mateen. And the tone of Obama's speech is especially delicate since the political world has used the Orlando shooting to reopen the debates on both terrorism and also on gun control. Obama has called on uh, the weapon used by Mateen to be banned, uh, and even gun advocate Donald Trump has organized a meeting with the gun rights lobby to try and block people on a terror watch list from being allowed to buy weapons. Uh, now, for more on this, I'm joined by uh, our international affairs editor, Melissa Bell. Hi, Melissa. Hi there. Uh, and What's in it for Trump here? I mean, he is someone who's always advocated uh, the right to bear arms, to have a gun, and now he seems to be moving in the other direction. I don't think fundamentally his position has changed, but it is interesting that he's making noise in this direction. Of course, he's sufficiently... Uh, he's enough of a loose cannon that this is this was almost to be expected, that on issues like this, he will sometimes uh, uh, sing a slightly different tune to the rest of his party. It's not the first and it's no doubt the last time that we'll see this. And of course, he has actually been consistent on this issue because in December, just after the San Bernardino, Bernardino shootings, he made similar noises about the need to prevent uh, suspected terrorists from getting their hands on uh, weapons. And that could prove the key fact that is changing uh, the narrative for the Republicans. And he's not alone. Uh, there are a number of Democrats, of, of Republicans on Capitol Hill, specifically those who are in swing seats, whose seats are threatened at the next general election, the next presidential election, they are the uh, the, the next uh, the next uh, legislative elections in the United States. They are the ones who are now changing their tune and saying that yes, we do need to find a way of preventing suspected terrorists from getting guns, and that's the key issue. The question of terrorism is such an important one for the Republican Party. It was the one that was immediately raised by Donald Trump in the wake of the Orlando shooting, with him calling on Barack Obama to use the words uh, I I Islamic extremism. Uh, uh, and, and then accusing, calling on him to resign because he failed to do so. So it's such an important subject for the Republicans that you could just see that their commitment to uh, the uh, freedom to bear arms is, uh, they are ready to curtail that when it comes to would-be terrorists. Now, the details of which lists we should base that upon have yet to be organized and discussed and debated. But the fact uh, of a Republican acceptance for some kind of limitation to the right to bear arms for those suspected of, uh, of terrorist offenses, uh, I think is something that we're going to hear more and more about. 
And given that the Republicans are now ceding a little bit on that side, House Democrats, of course, also saying that people on uh, terrorist watch lists should be banned from buying guns. Is it, I mean, could we see a move towards actually some kind of gun control legislation? It, it looks as though we might, uh, very limited. And you have to remember that there's been no significant move on the federal laws uh, controlling guns uh, since 2007, so in nearly 10 years. And that was in the wake of Virginia Tech. And even that was only uh, to bring uh, um, uh, greater background checks to those who wish to buy them. Uh, the more fundamental ban, for instance, on assault weapons which ran out in 2004 is nowhere near coming back. Let's be absolutely clear about that. But there is this determination on the part of the Democrats, of course, as well. And there was an important measure of it overnight when there was this 14-hour filibuster uh, from uh, the Democrat Chris Murphy, determined to have the legislation uh, that had been put forward back in December in the wake of the San Bernardino shootings uh, by uh, the Senator for California, Dianne Feinstein, amendments to that that would see greater background checks and an ability uh, to prevent those uh, on terrorism watch lists uh, from getting access access to guns. But when we talk about those terrorism watch lists, it's quite interesting because, of course, there are two. There's the, the, the very high security one uh, where people can't fly. Now, that no-fly list sort of seems quite obvious and, and easy to, to, uh, to manage. But then you've got about one million people who are on a sort of wider watch list where they're not stopped from doing day-to-day -day activities. They're just under surveillance. And this is a problem that the, Demo that the Republicans have with the Democratic proposal, the one put forward uh, by Chris Murphy uh, overnight, is that uh, it curtails the rights of too many people who've simply had no choice charges brought against them and they're not prepared to stomach that. So there, it probably won't go as far as the Democrats wanted to go since, of course, the Republicans retain control on Capitol Hill. But the fact that the Republican Party is shifting, at least on this particular edge of the issue when it comes to terrorism offensive, suggests that there could be some kind of compromise ahead, some kind of way of ensuring that those who've been accused of terrorism are uh, prevented or things are made harder. Uh, more obstacles are put between them and access to guns. And I think that's something that we're likely to see emerge over the coming days. So perhaps tentative steps towards some kind of breakthrough. Melissa Bell, thank you very much. Now, we are watching France 24, and let's give you a reminder of our top stories here. Northern France braces for more violence ahead of England's Euro 2016 match against Wales. Last night in Lille saw more clashes between England supporters and French riot police. Wreckage found from missing Egypt Air Flight 804, one month after it crashed into the Mediterranean. The race is now on to find the crucial black box before it stops emitting signals. And two new polls put the Brexit camp well ahead of those voting to stay in the EU. Just a week to go now until Britain's vote in a referendum on their membership. Time for Focus now, and in today's report, our team has been talking to some of the Russian athletes whose careers hang in the balance after a massive doping scandal erupted in November. Athletes, coaches and even politicians were accused by the International Athletics Federation of falsifying samples and of blackmail. Since then, Russia has put in reforms, but will they be enough to convince the Federation not to ban the country from competing in the Rio Olympics this summer? With the decision expected tomorrow, Thomas Lowe went to find out. Here in the Moscow suburb of Zhukovsky, a major championship is underway. It's an annual event, but for the first time, Russian athletes are competing alone. This year, no sportsmen have come from overseas. Since it was excluded from the International Athletics Federation, the IAAF, Russia can no longer organize international competitions or take part in them. These champions have done months of training for the Olympic Games in Rio, and the atmosphere here is heavy. A lot of us here are wondering if it wouldn't be a good idea to go and find a job. Others are thinking about leaving. For me, well, I have no idea. It's difficult, really difficult, and we're sad. In the stands are some who've played a role in Russia's huge doping scandal. Valentin Maslakov, who resigned as coach of Russia's athletics team. And that's Tatiana Ferova, who won silver in the 400-metre relay at the 2008 Olympics in Beijing. She stands to lose that medal because her samples from those games have just been tested again. The tests came back positive. You want me to believe that in other sports, in other countries, they train without using products that allow athletes to improve their performance and their recovery times. A normal human being can't train two times a day and keep up that level of exertion. 
So you're saying it's impossible to achieve high-level results without doping substances? Olympic-level results are impossible without doping. Why else do you think so many past records are now being cancelled? A level of openness rare in Russia. Meanwhile, the authorities are doing all they can to restore their image. Russia's sports ministry has even taken on an American PR company. Today, these specialists are taking the foreign press to visit the Russian anti-doping laboratory. The very same one that had its accreditation withdrawn by WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency. Here are the samples of urine kept from 2014 and 2015. We're now waiting for the WADA's decision regarding these samples. Either we'll send them to an accredited laboratory abroad, or if WADA authorizes us to, we'll use them, adhering to the procedures in force. For the time being, though, the Russian laboratory is out of action. Its former head, Grigory Rutchenkov, resigned after WADA accused him of manipulating samples. Then he fled to the US. WADA also says that while Rutchenkov was there, the FSB, Russia's secret services, controlled the lab. Marina was just an employee there at the time. Now she's under strict instructions not to speak about her former boss. The civil servants keep their silence because this scandal's tarnished the highest levels of state. At the Brazilian embassy in Moscow, the ambassador has put on a presentation of the Olympic Games. Delegates from Russia's Olympic Committee are among those invited we decided to speak to Igor Kazakov, who's in charge of the Russian team's participation at the Games in Rio. In front of the camera, he keeps it brief. I'd prefer it if we spoke about more positive things. In any case, right now we shouldn't be focusing on problems that concern only a minority of athletes, because yes, those who are linked to doping shouldn't participate in the Games. We then tried to speak with Igor Hatochkin, in charge of international relations for Russia's Olympics Committee. Do you think it's really possible to resolve such a large, significant problem? These officials wouldn't tell us any more. The IAAF will announce tomorrow whether or not Russia's efforts are enough to allow its athletes to participate at the Olympic Games. In the meantime, Fyodor Shutov continues to train. Newly crowned as Russia's marathon champion, Fyodor continues to set record times, but his chances of going to Rio are slim. That's because the IAAF hasn't included him in its pool of athletes which take the anti-doping tests obligatory for the Games. The Olympic Games are the ultimate goal. It's a life's dream for an athlete. That's where the real competition is, where you really fight to be the best. The next Games are in four years, and I don't even know if I'll still be in the running. Now, though, Russian athletes can do little but wait for the final decision and hope the IAAF won't stop them all competing in Rio.
Well, for more on that subject, I'm joined via Skype by Fabien Holl, a professor of the sociology of sport at the University of Lausanne. Thanks for being with us, Fabien. Now, just yesterday, the World Anti-Doping Agency has issued a report saying its officials in Russia are being stopped from testing athletes uh, and also that they're being threatened by security services there. Now, that comes, of course, just before a decision tomorrow, Friday, on whether or not Russia uh, is going to be banned from the Olympics this year. The Kremlin denying any involvement in the doping, uh, says it's all part of a Western campaign campaign against Russia. But the fact that the state is still not cooperating now surely suggests uh, otherwise, doesn't it? Yeah, of course. It's it's not just a, a campaign from the Western country. Of course, uh, doping is it's, it's a long history. And during the Cold War, uh, both sides were doping. So it, it's uh, from the 60s and during the 70s and, and so on, people were fighting through sports. And uh, it, both sides use a lot of doping products. But uh, today things have changed and, and in, in some countries you, you, you have organization anti-doping agencies that, that are working better than in others. That's also a fact. Uh, and when you talk about those anti-doping agencies, uh, well, th there has been a lot of criticism levelled at uh, the World uh, Anti-Doping Agency, uh, conflicts of interest cited. I mean, is there a systematic and an institutional problem within the way that uh, anti-doping is carried out? No, you cannot say it's a systematic problem uh, because uh, it's not always the, the WADA was in charge of that. It was... In the chaos of uh, IAAF was uh, a federation and its own policies on anti-doping and was a part of the federation, there was a corruption at the head of the federation. I inside the federation you have a diversity of people and some are fighting against doping. And in the international federation you have members that are involved in anti-doping policies, strong, they're not always successful, but are really involved, and, and some federations that are playing a kind of other games. So the uh, situation is, is more complex, in fact. Uh, and if, if we think now that Russia's managed to hide this you know, large-scale doping for such a long time, uh, should we be worried that there are other countries that also could be helping their athletes to take performance-enhancing drugs as well? Yeah, it, yeah, we could expect that other countries are also involved in, in, in supporting athletes. It could be directly, uh, which was more the case in, in the 70s, 80s, uh, with states very involved, including in Western countries. Uh, today, uh, I would say it's more indirectly, because in some countries, uh, People don't care or don't involve a lot of money in the anti-doping policies, so um, they, they could s seem to, to be very involved in anti-doping policy, but in, in fact, if you don't put money, if you don't control your athletes and so on, it, it's, it's also, also a lack of... of of work for anti-doping. And Fabien, I've got, one, I've got one quick question for you. Why is it so important for Russia to be so successful at these international events? It, it, it's very important because it's part of the soft power. You know, uh, at an international level, you, you have uh, international relation and part of the international relation uh, is going through um, sporting events. So it means that they, they want to have big events. Uh, for example, World Cups or so, even Olympic Games, they, they had uh, previously. And they also need to uh, be recognized for, for their athletes, for their sport. It, it's, it's, they are proud to have athletes. And they also want to have uh, the power into some federation. So they are connection into each federation, into the IOC, into the big federation. Fabien, so I'm so sorry, I'm going to have to cut you off. I wish we could talk some more about this, but that's all we've got time for. Fabien Ol, thank you very much for speaking to us yeah, there. Thank you. Uh, and that's it for me for this hour, but do stay with us. I'll be back in 15 minutes.